Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com. This is the part 5 of ischemic heart disease series. In my earlier sessions, I had discussed in detail about the etiopathogenesis and the morphological features of myocardial infarction. And in this session, let's learn a very important aspect of myocardial infarction that's clinical features and diagnosis of myocardial infarction. So when we talk about myocardial infarction diagnosis, in the earlier session what we had discussed was the morphological findings which would help us in identifying that this heart could have had myocardial infarction particularly in the autopsy settings. Whereas in real life scenarios when the patient comes with symptomatology, how do we diagnose? It depends upon the clinical features, the lab diagnosis and the ECG findings. Coming to the clinical features, the most important manifestation of myocardial infarction is the chest pain. right? So this chest pain Often it is prolonged, usually more than 30 minutes in duration. When I say chest pain, this typical location is substernal. It can be crushing. It could be some people say it is a stabbing kind of chest pain. Some people say it's a squeezing type of chest pain. And it is often associated with rapid and weak pulse. Some patients present with profuse sweating, which is referred to as diaphoresis, along with nausea and vomiting. And that's because of the involvement of the posterior inferior ventricle along with secondary vagal stimulation. Okay, and these are the ones who present with diaphoresis, that is profuse sweating with nausea and vomiting. Again, they can also manifest with features of dyspnea. Dyspnea meaning you know, awareness of one's own breathing or difficulty in breathing. right? And that's because of the impaired contractility of the ischemic myocardium, which results in pulmonary congestion and edema. And because of pulmonary congestion and edema, patient manifests with symptoms of respiratory difficulty and that's dyspnea right in around 25 percent of patients the onset of myocardial infarction can be absolutely asymptomatic usually these patients are chronic diabetics in the setting of diabetic neuropathy so that's the typical you no know, clinical manifestation of myocardial infarction now let's understand the lab diagnosis of myocardial infarction what we need to do here is we should demonstrate the blood levels of proteins and these are the proteins which leak out of the irreversibly damaged myocytes right and these proteins are nothing but the cardiac specific troponins and these troponins are troponin t and troponin i normally these proteins are the ones which regulate calcium mediated contraction of the cardiac muscle when the myocardium is damaged because of ischemia, what really happens is these proteins leak out of the myocardial cells into the circulation, right? Now, once we realize that the troponins are out into circulation, we also should understand what are all the various factors which affect the serum troponin levels. And these factors include, one, the volume of damaged myocardium, okay? More the volume, more the amount of troponins you can see. Second, the blood flow and the lymphatic drainage in the area of infarct also determines the, um, the amount of serum troponin levels. Another important factor is the rate of elimination of the marker from the blood. Sooner the troponin levels are eliminated, the troponin levels tends to decrease in circulation. Right? So these are the important factors which affect the serum troponin levels. So, when I say troponin levels, it usually begins to rise in around 2 hours as you see in this graph and peak at around 24 to 48 hours. Okay, So, this is the day of days of days after the onset of myocardial infarction and this is the concentration of the troponin levels. So, the troponin level peaks at around 24 to 48 hours and then gradually comes down and return back to normal reference range at around 6 or 7th day of onset of acute myocardial infarction. Now, if this ischemic myocardium is reperfused, so there is also an effect of you no know, reperfusion on the troponin levels. Let us see that in this illustration. This dotted line is the effect of reperfusion on the troponin levels where you see the peak of the 
troponin is pretty much earlier right the troponin levels are higher as well as peak also earlier that that's because of very rapid wash out of the marker from the necrotic tissue once you reperfuse the myocardium so the because of the rapid washout the troponin levels may be much more and also peak earlier well it is very important to understand the clinical background while you are assessing the troponin levels okay because there are other conditions where troponin levels are increased and these conditions include it could be myocarditis or even myocardial trauma congestive heart failure pulmonary embolus renal failure and even sepsis can also result in increase in troponin levels but fortunately these conditions do not usually follow the same abrupt injury time course what is an abrupt injury time course you know it gradually rises begins to rise at around 2 hours 2 to 4 hours peaks at 24 to 40 48 hours and then comes back to normal at around 6 to 7 days right so this particular course is not seen in these conditions it's the reason why it is very important to measure the troponin levels serially okay when the patient comes to the hospital at the end of day one and at the end of day two and finally at around three or fourth day so that you can know that the troponin levels are decreasing in volume and another important finding where myocardial infarction is diagnosed is based on ECG findings, right? And this ECG finding, you need to understand the normal ECG, you know, that's the P wave, that is the Q, R, this is the S, and that is the T wave, right? And this particular segment is known as SE segment. Now, depending upon the type of infarct, whether it is a transmural infarct or a subendocardial infarct, ECG is changed or the, the electrocardiogram differs. Now, what is that difference between transmural infarct ECG and a subendocardial infarct ECG? In transmural infarct or in cases of transmural infarct, what you see is very classically ST segment elevation, right? This is referred to as ST segment elevation or ST elevation myocardial infarct, which is abbreviated as STEMI. In contrast to the transmural infarct, where there is ST segment elevation, the subendocardial infarct do not have ST segment elevation. And that's why it's called as non ST segment elevation myocardial infarct or NSTEMI or NSTEMI. There can be, you know, depression of the ST segment or even. P wave inversion can be seen in these cases. So it's important to note that the infarct can be ST elevation myocardial infarct or non ST elevation myocardial infarcts. So that's about today's session where we discussed in brief about the clinical features, the lab diagnosis, and the ECG findings. Now I have to disclose that you now this particular session is purely for academic. That was for medical students and if you have any of these symptoms, it's always important to seek your doctor. That's for today. In the next session, I will be discussing in detail about the complications of myocardial infarction and that would be the last session on myocardial infarction series. Thank you for watching. If you have liked this video, hit the like button. Do comment if you have any queries to ask or if you want any topics to be covered, please do comment and your comments are the one which motivates me to you know record more and more videos if you find this video useful please do consider subscribing and do share with your friends thank you